everybody, it's John King, and here we are on Friday, March the 31st. I'm here with my weekly update. So last week I did a pretty long update. It was like 20 minutes long, and I got some great feedback. And I was told that I covered really good information, and so I want to do it again, and I'm shooting for 30. I'm not shooting for 30, but I am going to talk because uh, people gave me some good feedback that they liked what I was saying. So we're going to follow the same process that I followed last week. I'm going to tell you what I'm going to tell you, and then I'm going to tell it to you, and then I'll summarize it at the end. So what are we going to talk about? The first thing we're going to talk about is dream for all and education updates. What's what do I know about the problems with getting home by your education on dream for all and how are we going to solve that issue? The second thing we're going to talk about is how the new value acceptance is really going to work. This is the appraisal process where starting April 15th, we're going to get value acceptance. And what is that really going to mean? Uh, the third thing I'm going to talk about is COVID forbearance, the process of giving somebody six months off on their payments and putting it to the end of the mortgage is now going to be applicable for lots of different reasons, not just because of COVID. So I'll explain that. The next thing I'm going to talk about is how rates are ending the first quarter. Today is the last day of the first quarter. Tomorrow is April Fool's Day. You might be listening to this on April Fool's Day. Uh, so remember, it's April Fool's Day um, and kind of what's going on with the rate market. And then the final thing I'm going to talk about is are we ready, headed for a repeat of the issues that happened in the early 2000s? And that's a loaded question, but it's actually one worth diving into. Here's why. Because in the early 2000s, the Bush administration really pushed the agenda of driving home ownership and having more people be homeowners. And it led to the collapse that we had in 2007, 2008. And we're seeing some of the th same things. I'm seeing the same, some of the same things from state and federal levels. And it begs the question of, is this something that we're going to run into? Are we up against another recipe for disaster? I'm going to give you my thoughts on that at the end. All right, so let's go ahead and dive in and talk about my first talk. The Dream for All program is launching with a super, super high amount of intensity, a super high amount of interest. And I did a video yesterday about the major challenge that we've hit now, which is the delays in getting home by your education completed. Well, I want to do a follow up to that. If you haven't seen that video, you can see the link down below to it. Watch that video. But here's what I've learned over the last 48 hours uh, as I've been really trying to figure out how this works and how we're going to take best care of you and your clients. So when you go to eHome, which is the online version of counseling, you do the seven hour course, which some of my clients have said takes as little as 30 to 45 minutes. And once you're done with the seven hour online course, then the eHome portal assigns you to a counseling agency for the one-on-one -on -one consultation. I was a bit confused because I had clients telling me they called this company and other clients calling that company. And I finally realized how the system works is CalHAFA's eHome system assigns you a counseling agency and sends you an email link with that counseling agency's contact information. That counseling agency is now the buyer's new best friend. Okay. As a matter of fact, maybe the counseling agent is going to have to call out a restraining order against some of my buyers because they have been heavily aggressive in trying to get an appointment sooner than what was provided to them. So I want to explain what my recommendation is and how to navigate these waters. First of all, once you get assigned a counseling agency, they're going to just put a date for you of when your counseling is going to happen. You have to talk to me and say, hey, John, I'm, I'm in contract. Is that date going to work? If you're not in contract, just leave it alone and get that date and complete it and you'll be fine. The certificate is good for a year. But if you're in contract, then we have to figure out, is that date going to be acceptable? I had a client today who's got a, a, a in contract closing in 30 days. It's March 31st. And the date he was given was May 2nd. Well, that's impossible because I have to have that certificate at least two weeks before the close of escrow date and maybe three. So he's going to have to follow these instructions that I'm providing to you. Please don't everybody use this because if everybody uses this process, even when you're not in contract, then there's no way for us to get people who are in contract done sooner. Okay. So we need to have the honor system here. It's really simple. You got to harass the company either by email or by phone or by both, making it clear that you need to be on the list for cancellations because people are going to cancel. And so if somebody cancels their appointment and you're on that list, then they'll move your appointment up. If you are not in contract, please do not get on a list for cancellations. Save that for people who are in contract. But when you call and you say, hey, I'm in contract, and they, the May 2nd date doesn't work, I need your help. That's when they can get you moved up 
and give you, at least tell you, hey, we'll call you. One of my clients got a call 24 hours later and was moved up like 10 days faster. So critical that you use that information and that you'll, the, the home buyer will get an email once they're done with the first part of the e-home counseling that will be from Cal Hafa that says, this is your credit counseling company that you're working with. And it's randomly assigned through the rotation, which is why everybody's going to have different advice on how to make it work because it's all how to accelerate the, the appointment time because every one of you are assigned a different counseling agency randomly. All right. So I now want to go on to my second topic for today. The value acceptance change that I announced last week, Cal Hafa, not Cal Hafa, uh, Fannie Mae and Freddie Mac have announced that they're going to allow value acceptance. If you did, didn't see that video from last week, there's a link down below to the segment that, uh, that I talked about that last week. Um, what I want to explain today is I've, I've listened to a couple podcasts, I've done more research, and I want you to understand kind of how the process flow is going to work. If the system gives us feedback that says value acceptance with data collection, then what's going to happen is we as a lender have to uh, contact a person who's going to do the, the, the data collection. Well, it's kind of going to be like the appraisal management company. They're already recruiting and hiring people. There are, a lot of them are going to be real estate agents who are doing BPOs that are now going to transfer to doing a lot more of these. Some of them are going to be insurance claims adjusters that are going out and visiting homes and taking pictures for insurance claims. They'll visit homes and do this. And they're going to walk through with an app on their phone that'll take a lot of measurements using digital tools that can measure the home and get a floor plan of the home and take a lot of pictures of the home. So the app's gonna walk them through what to do to collect all of these data points. If once those data points are collected, there's an issue that says, hey, there's a discrepancy or there's a problem with the data that was created, then it can be upgraded to what's called a hybrid appraisal. Now, a hybrid appraisal means that the appraiser is doing a desktop appraisal. They're not going out to the property. They're using the pictures and the measurements that were provided by the data collector, but they're, having, they're able to then adjust for the condition, adjust for the issues that came up during data collection that says, hey, we can't trust that original value because the data doesn't match, that the square footage is different. Something is wrong, and so we have to convert it to a hybrid appraisal. But now there's another step, which is the appraiser has to accept the data that was collected by the data collector. And the appraiser has the right to reject it. The appraiser can say, look, I'm not gonna put my name on it. I don't trust the information that this data collector provided. And so now we're gonna run into an issue that that then needs to be upgraded back to a full appraisal, which is kind of where we started and what we were trying to avoid. So this all kicks off on April 15th. We'll see where it ends up, but it's definitely going to be a bumpy road. And we're going to have to play with it. I think it's a win, but I think there's going to be a lot of challenges that we're going to have to work. Third through. topic I want to talk about today is COVID forbearance and how that's going to apply. Fannie Mae and Freddie Mac, back in the days of COVID three years ago, announced a forbearance process that says, hey, we can, we can have, put all of the payments that you missed onto the end of your mortgage because we know that you had a hardship with COVID and you couldn't afford to make the payment. And so we're going to just automatically put that at the end of the mortgage with no interest added, no payments you have to make on it. You just pay it back when you sell the home or you re uh, refinance the home down the road, you pay the money back. Well, now Fannie and Freddie just came out only on Fannie Mae and Freddie Mac loans and said, look, this worked really well and we want to give our homeowners some options when other hardships come up. So I think this is a big win that if somebody has a different type of a hardship and they have uh, you know, a disability that creates a, a short-term job loss or, or some other major expense, the, the servicer of the loan has the right to take six months of your payments and put them towards the end of the loan. Now, I don't know if they can do that multiple times. What if you have a loan that already had money put at the end of the loan because it had a COVID forbearance? I don't know. But I do know that they're making that permanent and they're saying, hey, if something comes up in somebody's life that becomes a temporary hardship, you can use this tool. You can take six months of payments and put it onto the end of the loan. That's a win when we're looking at the government trying to help people maintain successful home ownership. All right. So now I want to talk about the fourth topic of what I'm going to discuss today, which is how rates are ending the first quarter. Here we are, it is March 31st of 2020, 2023, oh my gosh, not 2021, March 31st of 2023, and it has been a wild ride with interest rates. We started out in January with interest rates falling, they've been falling since November, early November, when the inflation report came out, 
and said, hey, inflation is starting to go the right direction. And so we saw inflation go in the right direction. November rates go lower. December rates go lower. January rates are moving a little bit lower. We had gone from seven and a quarter in October down to tickling the fives, high fives in January. And then bam, February things shoot up. We end up with interest rates. By the end of February, we're interest rates back in the seven, seven and a quarter range. And then March, things started to get better. Really, a banking crisis came in to save the day. And I know that's kind of demented to say it that way, but it did. And so now we've got the banking crisis. We've got the Fed saying, hey, maybe we're going to slow down our rate hikes. Um, and the truth is the banking crisis, depending upon how it plays out, some, I read an article that they described the current banking crisis as watching a train wreck happen in slow motion because it's even though we had two weekends in a row of problems, the underlying problems have not been fixed. And we're going to see banks pulling back and lending. I've done some videos about that, that we're going to see less loans being out there because banks are going to hold more of their deposits and keep more liquidity. And they're going to slow down on buying treasury bonds and mortgage bonds because those bonds pay really well in the long term. But if you need your money back in the short term, it's not going to work. So here's the bottom line is we're going to see continued volatility. We've got rates right now in the low sixes, low to mid sixes across the board. We're going to see huge volatility going forward, especially because I think that April's inflation report is going to show a little bit higher of a number and the market's going to freak out. And I think we're going to see rates tick up in April like we saw in February. I think that May's inflation report by mid-May is going to show those numbers looking good again and we'll see interest rates come back down a little bit in May. I'm always careful about how I'm predicting the future, but I follow some super smart people, way smarter than all of us, uh, who are looking at the numbers and looking at the charts, um, and I agree with their analysis. So I think we're going to have a rocky road over the next couple of months, uh, but we should see this summer looking better in interest rates. I hope that we can be tickling the fives again come summer, but I think we're going to see some pressure going back up into the high sixes or maybe the sevens uh, into the month of April. So beware of the month of April and early May. Uh, and if you have a loan, lock it early. Let's get you moving forward. If you have a loan that's uh, not closing for a while, talking about long-term lock options, we've got some good options to do that as well. All right. The final topic that I want to talk about is what the heck is happening right now in the housing market that is kind of similar to what happened back in 2000. And so we'll kind of go, go from there. Here's the deal. The housing market in the early 2000s was lit with a kerosene blowtorch because the federal government, the president of the United States had an agenda to increase the number of homeowners from what the historical levels are. I don't remember the numbers. I'm not going to quote them. I'm not going to uh, just pick a number, but you know, whatever the historical levels were, they said, hey, this is about the average of what percentage of the American population is owners versus renters. We want to tick up the owners. We want to help people that haven't been able to buy a home become homeowners. Well, the problem is, is that at a certain point you, you say, well, why can't those people become homeowners? Oh, because they don't have enough money for a down payment. Okay, then let's fix that. We've got programs. We'll, we'll loan you the money and you need zero down payment. What's the next? But that didn't get the numbers high enough. And so now the government says, okay, well, what's the next hurdle? Well, you know, their, their credit's holding them back. Well, okay, but you know, being a homeowner is better than being a renter. And long term, you're going to make more money as a homeowner than a renter, which by the way, I agree, as long as you can maintain being a homeowner. So the government says, well, gosh, they're going to make way more money long term. So let's go ahead and drop the credit requirements and make it easier for them to get a mortgage because long term they'll be, they'll be better off. And so that's a good thing for the marketplace. That's a good thing for the economy. And it's a good thing for the administration to raise the numbers that we're looking for to get more people to become homeowners. Okay. Then they start saying, well, that still isn't getting us to our goal. So now what are we going to do? What's what's preventing people from from making it? We've we fixed the down payment problem and and we fixed the credit problem and well there's only one thing left and that's income. But but gosh, you know what? Housing prices always go up. So if somebody can't afford to make their payment, then they can just sell the house and they'll still be better off than if they never became a homeowner. So so let's just go ahead and and remove the income requirement. Let's let's let people buy a house with with no money out of pocket and let them buy a house with no worries about where where their credit is. And let's go ahead and not worry about what their income is either, because, well, it's all, it's all going to work out just fine. Mortgages have performed well for a long, long period of time. That's what led to the problems that happened in 2007 and 2008 with one really, really, really important distinction. 
that there was a fourth factor that said, hey, we ignored their down payment, we ignored their credit, we ignored their income, but their people just still aren't comfortable making that monthly payment. How do we get them comfortable making the payment? I know, let's give them an adjustable rate mortgage because that way they're paying a lower monthly payment for now. And by the time that rate takes off, they'll be able to refinance because housing prices always go up or do they? So that was the recipe that oversimplified, but that's the recipe that led to the housing market crash in 2007 and 2008. How does that compare to today? Well, here's the deal. We have a federal, we have a, a presidential administration. And by the way, I'm not being political, I'm being factual. We have a presidential administration that believes in home ownership. That's great. The presidential administration wants to increase the number of homeowners as a percentage compared to renters. Sounds a lot like the presidential administration in the early 2000s. Okay, but that's just a, one similarity. So now what the president is doing is they're reallocating money. They're making it more expensive to refinance. They're making it more expensive. Uh, maybe people who had what we consider the top tier credit of 740 with 20% down, they're saying, yeah, that's not the top tier anymore. And so, <clears throat> so you gotta be a 780 credit score and put 40% down to be the top tier. And those 740 credits with 20% down, we're charging them extra but we're gonna make it cheaper for somebody that has a 650 credit score that is putting a smaller down payment because we really, those are the, that's the segment of people that's having a hard time qualifying for a mortgage. So they're moving money around from the federal side. They're trying to introduce uh, programs. The president, when he was first elected said, I'm gonna have a first time home buyer grant program that's gonna give everybody thousands of dollars to buy a home. That hasn't taken off, that didn't happen but our state governor just did that. So I am a huge proponent of the California Dream for All program that just launched. If you haven't been listening to me talk about it, you haven't been listening to me at all. I think it's an amazing program, but here's the deal. Nothing is a free lunch. Every, uh, what, every, what is it? Uh, uh, equal and opposite reaction. Every action has an equal, equal and opposite reaction. So you, we've got a situation where we're promoting home ownership. We are helping, I'm helping so many families get homes right now that wouldn't have been able to get a home otherwise. And the good news is they're doing it with fixed interest rates. The really good news is they've got to have a good credit score. The really, really good news is they've got to have a good enough debt to income ratio. So the only thing that we're ignoring right now is their money for a down payment. But it's a slippery slope because those were the first two things that we ignored 20 years ago. And so if we keep going down this road, what are we headed towards? Also, short term, that's a long term worry. My short term worry, we have no homes for sale. Now I'm not being literal. There are homes for sale, but you know, in the Sacramento market, I heard a stat this morning that we normally have over 8,000 homes for sale in the Sacramento market. Uh, and I, I don't know if that's Sacramento County, Sacramento, uh, uh, three County, four County area. I don't know. All I know is that the number is currently less than half of that. So we have normal inventory of over 8,000 homes and we have less than 4,000 homes listed for sale. And we just lit a fire under the demand for home buyers with this Dream for All program. So the timing is not good because sellers are not selling in droves. And everybody's worried about the housing market crashing. It is not going to crash because the crash happened in 07 and 08 because sellers had to sell because they were being foreclosed upon or they had an adjustable rate mortgage and their payment was going up. Not many people who have mortgages right now have to sell. They have a fixed rate that's below 3%, sometimes below 2%, and they're super comfortable with their monthly payment. They're not selling. We're not going to have a huge wave of inventory coming in, but we now have a huge wave of buyers coming in, and that money's going to run out quickly. I'm thinking a couple, three months before the money runs out. Well, in the short term, that's kind of like eating a whole bunch of candy and you get the sugar high, and as soon as the sugar high goes away, you crash and you sleep. So is that mean that you, you know, it, it was it completely detrimental? No, there's more things you can do to yourself that are way more detrimental than having a sugar high and going to sleep after that. But it does have a reaction. So we're going to see house prices pop up right now. And what happens in three or four months when all these buyers go away? There's still not going to be enough, in my opinion, still not going to be enough homes for sale to meet the demand of buyers. And we've actually whet the appetite of people wanting to buy a home and maybe they'll buy with other programs that aren't as advantageous as this one. Only time will tell. So I'm not worried about us crashing, but I'm worried about a bump that's going to slow back down a little bit. I'm worried about where are we going to get the inventory because I'm, I have a home buyer buying in the Bay Area right now. They're, they're getting 20 
offers per home. And I was talking to three listing agents this morning on, on offers that were being written. And they said, look, we've seen the market turn in the last week or two, and it is taking off. So we have a super hot housing market. If you think that the media is correct and saying, oh my gosh, this is a buyer's market because nobody wants to buy with interest rates this high, the media is 100% wrong. This is a seller's market for the sellers that want to sell. Very, very few sellers want to sell. So for those that are selling, it's a great time. For those who are thinking about selling, it's a great time to sell. The problem is most people who are sellers also have to buy. Why would you sell and get rid of a 2.5% interest rate just to buy to get a 6.5% interest rate? Yes, some people are doing it, but not as many as normally do. Gang, I really appreciate you listening to me. Here I am, I'm 20 plus minutes, but... I hope that this is valuable. I hope that listening to me kind of give you my thoughts on a weekly basis helps you. And I hope that you tune in regularly. Please share this with anybody that you know. If you've listened to this long, then you've gotten value out of this. And I'd like for you to share this. Share it, uh, like, subscribe, and hit the notification bell on YouTube. And then share this. Email it out to your friends and family and colleagues. Share it on other social media sites. Um, I really want to provide more value, and I'm looking to do it with this kind of content and this kind of a format. So if you like this, help me promote it and help me get my word out there. I appreciate it very much. By the way, I do mortgages. So if you need a mortgage, give me a call. I would love to take great care of you. Have a great week, and we'll talk to you soon. Bye-bye.